All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Huai Zhupeng, and it's super excited for me to be here. And actually, I haven't been giving a talk for a couple of years since COVID, so it's really nice to be here to talk to you all in person. Uh, my name is Huai Zhupeng. I'm talking about uh, Fabricit. Uh, before I get into the machine and the things I'm going to talk about here, before, uh, and I'm going to give you a background of myself. Uh, so I'm a assistant professor here uh, in the University of Maryland, College Park. And in the CS department, I, I, I lead the, the lab called Small Artifacts Lab. And here's the website, and here's the link. And as you can see, many of the things we do here in the lab are about human-computer interactions. We build systems and softwares and look into how we interact with different types of machines and how we can democratize the use of the machines and, uh, and such. And we put all the things we do in the lab, uh, in the lab on, on, on the website. And the things I want to mention are this one today. It's called Fabricate. It, it's really um, a rapid, proto rapid prototyping techniques to make uh, circuits flexible and also make it high resolution and also something that can be folded into 3Ds. So let's, let's, let, let me start to introduce the products with, with this, with this uh, image. Uh, so we all recognize this, right? This is like a 3D printer. It's actually uh, from Prusa. Uh, it's a uh, all open source hardware and software, and um, it has been well uh, widely accepted within our open source uh, where it's within our communities for uh, many years. And I want to say that because of this open source and open hardware uh, effort, we're able to have this very uh, affordable and reliable machines. And we have seen 3D printers in the past decade in I don't know, it's like makerspace, schools, and sometimes I even heard like some of the kindergartens even have this 3D printer machines in their, uh, in their space that allow people to tinker and try different things. So I really think that with the democratization of this reliable machines that really empowered us and give us the opportunity to make a lot of really cool things. Uh, I just found the couple of images online. Uh, here are some of the examples of what we can do with 3D printers, right? Uh, from some of the really cool pen holders to the parathesis is really helping people to something with um, very cool uh, mechanical features to adaptive uh, controllers that really uh, adapt to our personal needs. And 3D printing clothes and or the last one, I think it's like I saw a uh, resin printed uh, artificial muscle which is actually coming from it's fairly affordable 3D printers. So I, all I want to say here is like because of this effort with 3D printing and, and they are being reliable and available, uh, we as a maker communities were able to create a lot of amazing things. Uh, however, uh, if you look at all these images here, I would say there's still sort of one thing that's missing, right? Uh, with the 3D printing machines and the ecosystems, all of things we do here are rapid prototyping of the shape of the things, the form factors. And if we want to do something uh, with electronic functionalities, uh, IoT stuff, wearable stuff, uh, the really cool badges like this. Uh, we still need to go to uh, PCBs, right? Printing circuit. And unfortunately, unlike 3D printing, I would say that we still, as a maker communities, we don't really have a really accessible way to make a, a printed PCBs by ourselves. And there are some of the existing uh, methods for sure, right? Uh, one way to prototype circuits and, and electronics is, of course, is go to a breadboard and breakout board. They are super convenient. We do this all the time. Uh, we test the functionalities by packing them into this breadboard and wiring them to tag the features. Uh, but they also have their own limitations and constraints, right? We have this breadboard that's always like rectangles and, and, and fairly rigid. And they can we can use them to tag functionalities, but we cannot really fit them into uh, the form factors of the 3D, uh, 3D print objects very easily. We can also create our own circuit, uh, something called chemical etching. This is actually fairly popular among, uh, among, among uh, um, people in our communities. The way to do that is like you put the copper sheet uh, uh, substrate into some of the chemicals and etch out the, uh, the, the prints so that you can get this conductive traces. This also comes with its own limitations. Uh, it's it's kind of like an art to, to 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 try this and control the width and thickness of the traces. So it's pretty hard to do this precisely, and also we have to deal with all these chemicals. So that that has its own challenges. We also have CNC machines, some milling machines, uh, for example, uh, Bantam tools. So it's super cool machines, and 
we can have a desktop version of that in your lab, lab space, or maker space, and create circuits. They are pretty reliable and can give you high resolution circuit. Uh, the challenge for this is like the only only work with the rigid circuit. If you want to do wearables or something very small, some with very thin layers of the traces uh, with the base, uh, that's something uh, it's hard to do uh, with off the shelf uh, mining machines. So what do we want to do here with uh, our project is trying to find an eco solutions to a 3D printers to our makerspace and see if we can find the solutions for making circuits that are also that are all that are also sort of reliable, uh, affordable, and can create a whole bunch of things. And that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, fabricate. Uh, we aim to we have text here to fabricate high resolution, flexible, and all and even kirigami PCBs using uh, relatively affordable machines, and that is called fiber laser engraver. Uh, so this is the fiber laser engravers, right? Um, this is um, uh, this is not a new machine. This has been there for years, and if you ever have a iPhone or iPad having have the laser engraved name to the back of the phones or iPad, that's probably used uh, come from these machines, right? Um, so if you Google that, uh, you can find a lot of sources from Amazon or different places. They are fairly affordable, not super cheap, but uh, the current price will be ranged from like 1K to 3K, depends on the power you need. And I would say that is sort of on par with some of the CNC machines we have been using in the lab space as well, right? So. That's something we, we, we did with the fiber laser engravers, and you can see that some of the circuit we, we, we did were able to do. And I also bring some of the samples with me so you can find me after other talk. And for the rest of the talk, what I want to uh, mention are some of the basic concepts and, and knowledge about fiber lasers, so what it's about, and what is the process we make this fabricate and be able to make this high resolution circuit. and we can actually do more than just making the 2D circuits, right? I'm going to show you a couple of examples how we did that, and a bunch of examples we created, and we also bring it to here, and what we can do in the future with these technologies, right? So let's start with the introduction of fiber lasers. So that's that's very similar to actually the CO2 lasers we have in the lab space and maker space, except the laser source is different. It's from from the, it's coming from this stout laser source, and that Go through the optic fibers and then it sort of shoot the lasers to the to the surface of the uh, the material. And the way to do that is like they're not not using the uh, motors uh, and do the XY gantries so use the uh, galvanometer so that that allow the machine to scanning the surface of the objects uh, with a super fast speed. Uh, I will show you some videos you can see that in a moment. Uh, and talking from the material perspective, right? Uh, the fiber laser have a different uh, wavelengths. And that allows us to work uh, beyond just organic uh, uh, materials such as wood. And the fiber laser is also really good work with metals such as coppers, which is also the things we, we use uh, in the fabricate projects. Uh, so that's basically all about the fiber laser engravers. So it's a really affordable machine, can cut super fast, and works really nice with copper and metal sheet. And so let's let's move on to how to actually make a circuit with machines. Right, so if you see this, this is sort of like uh, expanded views of how a circuit will uh, looks like or co uh, composite, right? Uh, what we have here in general is like top and the bottom layers will be conductive layers because you want to make uh, conductive traces, right? And in between, if you're, if you're talking about like two, a two layer circuit, we have this dielectric insulation layers. And in our case, we want to make our own uh, substrate of cuttings. So the, the middle layers we chose is fairly uh, uh, popular options is Kapton tapes. It's a, it's, it's a matter that really can bear high temperatures and also come with adhesive itself, so it's pretty convenient. And to prepare the substrate, what we did is, uh, let me see, we put them together. As I said, they have the adhesives. We roll them through the press row so that we make it super uh, uh, even distributed across the surface. And optionally, if you want to make this aligned to our machines, you can also go through this cutting lamp holes. So all these are super high tech, right? And, and, and they are, I would say that they're fairly, fairly repeatable and, and reliable. So we can also do this ourselves. So once we prepare, prepare the materials, we can just send it to the machines. And 
use the machines to cut the traces, right? So the only challenge here is to cut the create create this uh, isolation area so that the traces won't touch the rest of the uh, rest of the copper. And the challenge here would be because you have a copper layer on the top and the capstone table in the middles, you want the lasers to cut through the top layers but not penetrating the middle layer, right? So we did a lot of experiment on the cutting parameters uh, with both vector cuttings and engravings. And it turns out that if we do vector cutting with certain uh, parameters here, we, 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 we can actually cut very reliably on just removing the top coppers, but keep the bottom uh, capstone types uh, still there. Uh, so we pre present some of the data here, but that uh, works with the machines we have here. I would say that with different machines, maybe we have different numbers, but we can show uh, how we did the experiment. And let me show the result here, right? So this is a real time cutting, right? As I said, because the scanning is super fast, so this is like real time cutting. You can see it's cut the circuit pretty fast and can also penetrate, if you tune the power, it can actually penetrate the, the entire two layer, three layers of material. So it can remove it from the substrate. So that's that's a circuit. And then they will require some of the labor time. Uh, so we need we need a tweezer to really remove all the these small gaps here. And then you can sort them together. So these are two examples of Arduino Nano. Uh, we made themselves. Uh, they, they're equal to functionalities. Uh, on the right, I think that's like one layer, uh, one layer uh, 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 PCB. The, the left part will be like double layers circuit. Uh, you can see they're pretty small, and, and the traces are also very fine. Uh, so what we see here are both examples are made uh, within five minutes of machine time. I do admit that it requires a lot of time for us to really remove the, the trace because my eye is not super good anymore. Uh, and we can achieve a, a minimum trace uh, with about eight mils and a clearance about four mils. So I would say this is sort of on par with the commercial uh, industrial circuit uh, surveys if outsourced so it's a pretty good result. Uh, actually, we tried uh, the trace with down to two mils that also works. And it's also pretty reliable thanks to the machine's uh, design. Uh, the challenge for us is like, because it's so thin, removing the, the gap will be a challenge. So there's really like human limitations here, right? Uh, so with that, let's just already show you if we can have these machines, what we can do with that, right? And that's a technique to create a 3D printer equivalent of making circuits uh, that are fairly reliable and can give us the flexibility to create circuits by, our own, uh, by ourselves. But actually, we can do more with this, right? So we can tune the flexibility of the circuit uh, by just changing different copper uh, materials. We can use the laser to assist us to actually do soldering because your laser actually generates heat. So you can do this. We can also uh, use lasers to form a 3D shapes or 2.5 D shapes by uh, using the laser to selectively apply the heat to different areas. I'm going to go to that part. Uh, so the flexibility is pretty easy. You just change different material and can, you can explore, uh, um, experiment with different compositions. Uh, the laser soldering is kind of interesting. So the way we do the laser soldering is we actually uh, use not vector cutting, but engravings. You you know, like when you do CO2 laser cutting, it's sort of scanning the surface uh, line by line. And if we do that with ore machines on the top of the copper, you actually generate heat at certain areas. So if you repeat that multiple times, the heat will be good enough to actually melt in some of the soldering paste. Uh, so what you see here on the right part or the blue part are, uh, if you have circuit like that, you can apply the lasers to that certain area. So it sac sacrifice the coppers a little bit, but that will generate enough heat to actually melt in uh, the soldering paste. Uh, here are some of the examples. Here is, I think this is um, IC with the laser soldering here, and that's another example. So you can see we have this uh, small gaps there, and that's the sacrifice laser cutting, but that's actually generating enough heat to melt the the soldering paste there, right? And you actually saw this video uh, at the beginning. So what we do here is like we actually just uh, laser soldering there so that we create this complete circuit and the LED is connected.
uh, a disclaimer that we're not controlling the temperature as the required soldering uh, uh, choice. We know that. But I think this is really good good to be used for rapid prototyping and can test the functionalities in you know, a fast way. And here are some, some of the more results. Uh, this is the, I think this is the resistor and then some IC. And on the right part, you can see we can actually do some of the very small uh, circuit soldering. And on the top is like 0402, uh, I think it's compatible resistor, I forgot. But this is actually something we can solder directly with the lasers. Uh, so that's another possibility is with these machines, what we can do. And as I mentioned, there's other things we can do that maybe if you just do outsourcing, you cannot really do that easily. We're just combining the circuit, which is the functionalities, to the shapes of the things or the forms directly so that we can create sort of more artistic designs or something that's really cool that's hard to do uh, just by outsourcing. Right, so this is laser forming. The, uh, the way it works is like you uh, selectively uh, apply the heat to the top of the surface and the heat is sort of related to how many passes you deposit the lasers to. And because the heat distributed is uh, it's not evenly distributed along the surface and to the bottom of the surface, you can actually make the metals curve up. And that can be computationally designed based on how many passes you have there. And here is a video of showing how it works. This is not real time, this is like a fast speed. But this is how it works. So you actually can use the laser to bend the circuit itself. <laughs> right, so we see, uh, we can actually bend this to up to 90 degrees. And of course, if you go over that, the things will get into the laser lines. But you can imagine we have a rotary uh, base, and then you can cut it, and you can actually bend it to uh, even more sharp angles. Uh, we try different ways to do this. We can also, we can always just do that at one location, or we can do this gradually, so we can sort of generate this curve shapes, right, depends on the things you want to design, and these are two examples. Uh, to facilitate the design of the 3D or Kirigami circuits, we actually have a, uh, a simple uh, web-based interface to allow people to do this. This is the examples. Uh, so on the left top corner, so we have this sort of the simulation to see the bending part. So you can have the uh, valley or, or different folding angles and then show it there. We actually have ways to place components there. I'll just skip the videos here. But here is when you put the machine uh, materials into the machine and ways the design we just saw, right? This is actually, you can actually fold this. Uh, this is the rotary machines we built ourselves. But so you can see we start to remove the cap uh, towns and then do the foldings here. Right, I, I really like that. I think, I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> and now it's actually the uh, real-time bending, so it's actually still pretty fast there. Right, so this is the example. So you're putting in the the batteries, you can have a... <laughs> have a so I actually, I bring the cranes here. So if you want to check, check it out, just, just find me after, after the talk. Uh, we can do more, right? So this is like a small uh, wearing with uh, LEDs and, and battery holders, and you can, you can have something like that. It's pretty cool. It's like because of the flexibility of the circuit, right? And I think we did something else here. Here is like a, a, a end stop for the 3D printers because you can design this yourself. You can create this functionality and the things together. This is like you have a high resolution coil and then you can have the electronics there. Uh, this is like a flexible, flexible circuit kit uh, trace and then you can actually design your own flexible ca uh, cables by yourselves. So these are some examples, right? And so what's next? Uh, I think this is really cool technology and really affordable. Well, really affordable is as we haven't really tried much, but but with the things we have, it's already fairly affordable and can good have some uh, can have some of a good result. Uh, we won't have more people to getting get get involved into this. Uh, there's only a, a, a certain amount of things we can do just by ourselves, but as a community, I think we can do a lot more things, a lot of cool things, right? Uh, Maybe you can do more with machines beyond circuit. We can do combining circuit with 3D shapes or 3D printings even. 
um, maybe we need a better software, open source software platform. Maybe you can share the designs, right? I think just like there's a lot of things we can do together. So uh, I will be here today. I will probably just bring some of the examples uh, in the uh, workshop space. So find me if you're interested in this, happy to chat. And with that, I'm just concluding my talk. And this work cannot be done without my amazing students, so Yan and, and uh, Anup Sathya, that they're leading authors of all this great, great work. I'm just here to present this, but they're really the one who make the, this happen. And we have our amazing collaborators from uh, George Mason's, uh, Sarah's, and Jemmings. They all contribute a lot to this product. And with that, I'm going to conclude my talk in 20 minutes. All right. Thank you.